I know it's just fine, okay? Has God been good to you? Amen. Oh, yeah. I got one good. I got a good. What about that? Has God been good to you? Oh, yeah. Amen. So, what I love about God is there are no parameters, no restraints on how good He is to us. He don't just bless us on Sunday, but He blesses us every day of the week. The question is, do you recognize how blessed you are? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, it's good to see everybody. Uh, here on Wednesday night for our Bible class, and we're going to be actually concluding uh, our second book that we're studying together, First Thessalonians. So we're going to be at chapter five, and so if you get uh, your Bibles out, and we're going to walk through that, and we're going to see what the Holy Spirit has to teach us today. Amen. 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 Is everybody ready? Amen. Amen. Let me pray real quick. Father, we thank you right now for your rich word. Father, we thank you for your mighty power. We thank you for your progressive revelation. And Father, how you have never forsaken us, nor leave us, Lord God. Right now, we just pray that you will bless this Bible study, Lord God. Bless each and every household represented here today. Father God, bless those who will tune in on YouTube and Facebook. Father God, so may, may this be a blessing to all who will partake of studying the Word of God with us today. Father, we just pray for our church. We pray for every member, every man, woman, boy, and girl, for every every marriage and every family. We pray for children and grandchildren. Father, that you would keep your hand upon us, oh God, that you would continue to lead us down the plain path that you've laid before us, that we might give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen. 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 So we're in chapter 5 uh, in the book of Thessalonians, which is the second book that was written as far as the New Testament scripture. Amen. The first book was the book of Galatians. Just a quick review. So in the book of Galatians, we studied that we are justified by faith and not by the works of the law. What we learned from the book of Galatians is that we cannot work our way into heaven. We just have to simply believe that God loved us so much that he sent forth his son who died for us on the cross. Amen. For I am reminded, Paul says, um, he said, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live it by the faith of the Son of God. I think that's significant because uh, my wife and I were sharing on our way to work this morning we were listening to the part. I said, it's interesting because you've been thinking you've been living on your faith, but according to the scripture, you're supposed to be living by the faith of the Son of God and he imputes our, his faith on us when we say, Lord, I believe you. Y'all ain't giving no, y'all ain't giving no praise for that because y'all, that's heavy stuff. So you say, well, you said, Pastor, you don't say, I just don't have enough faith. You're absolutely right. That's why you live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself a ransom for us. Amen? Amen. Paul taught us about what is the difference between walking and living in the spirit or walking and living in the flesh. So in chapter 5 there, he gives us the fruit of the spirit. Notice I said fruit, singular, of the spirit, which there are nine manifestations of the fruit. And then before that, he gives us a catalog of vices or, uh, if you will, immorality, uh, what it really means to walk according to the flesh. So after Paul solidifies that, he says, for there is neither Jew or Greek, neither male or female, neither slave or free, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. So right then and there, he breaks down that, that wall between genders, that wall between ethnicities, that wall between the haves and the haves not. He said, if you believe Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. This is powerful stuff for you to know as you think about how am I going to build my faith. If you could just rest on the principles of the word of God, it will build your faith for you. And so when life throws uh, some of the unfamiliar, from some of the unforeseeable events your way, you're not shaking, you're not moved because you know, wait a minute, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And if Christ what went through it and he was nailed to the cross and he got up just like he said he would. We understand no matter what life try to throw us on top of us, trying to make us go down, he's going to raise us up by his mighty power. Amen. And so then when we get to Thessalonians, which is written maybe a year or so later, 
he had now moved to a new young uh, congregation. He was, he was here at Silas and Timothy. They were shamefully treated in Philippi. They were beaten with many stripes, thrown in prison, and then they, at midnight, they sung hymns in and started praying unto the God to the fact it affected the whole prison. And so when God said, look at them, look at them praising me in the midnight hour when everything looks dark, everything looks gloomy, and they start praising and singing hymns. And, and so that's why I was in my wife was telling I said, we need to bring some hymns back. And, 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 and you know what I mean? Uh, 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 Jesus, keep me near the cross. That jumped into my spirit. Amen. Because they were singing these hymns and, and songs and, and praying, and God shook the prison and opened the door. First of all, he removed the chain, and then he opened up the door to give them access. See, watch it. Watch it. Why is that significant? Because some of us feel like we're in some prisons. You know what? You don't have to actually be incarcerated in Guadalupe County Jail to feel like you're a prisoner. And so, but but no matter what your circumstance or situation is, if you praise God in the midnight hour, in other words, symbolically, when it looks the darkest, when it looks the gloomiest, and you can still praise God and pray and sing a hymn and say, thank you, Lord, for right now, for where I am, He, yeah, I'm going to pray with it, that's okay. All right, so they leave there. And then they go through a couple of towns, uh, Apollos and Apollonia. He didn't stop there because the environment was not conducive for the preaching of the gospel. In other words, there was no, no Jewish synagogue in those towns. So Paul's like, well, I don't have an organ or a place to start. And you know what I learned about that study, man? Is that some places are not conducive for ministry. <laughs> Some, some environments you can go and try to witness, and, and, and this might be like, for example, on the job, it just might, you know, you want to witness, but sometimes you look at your environment and say, this won't be the appropriate time or the proper time to do that, but I'm going to have to try to see if I can catch him on the rebound. Because some environments are not conducive for you to sow that seed. That's like when you want to plant a garden. If the ground is not right, you're just throwing away seeds, planting on ground that's not fertile. So hold that, yeah, I ain't seeing, I ain't getting there. And, and, and I'm telling you, and I'm using this as a metaphor for some people, because you try to plant the word of some people, they just can't receive it. Because they, they got their, their, their environment is not right, the ecology is not right, the ground is too hard and stony, and it's not conducive to uh, receive that seed so that it can produce a harvest. Amen. And upward, sometimes some people are in a drought. Amen. So he'll probably look at, he goes to these two and says, no, we can't do that. So then he ends up in Thessalonica, and the first place he went was the synagogue and began to teach and preach that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that he rose from the dead according to the scriptures. All right, and so what we've been trying to express and teach is that if you're going to be empowered in your life relationally, if you're going to be empowered spiritually, if you're going to be empowered financially, you have to live by the word of God. Amen? Amen. So he's there, he's teaching, he's reasoning for them, with them in the synagogue for about three weeks, three Sabbaths. Uh, he wins over a few Jews, and then some of the Greek god fears uh, also believe, and then all of a sudden the Jews got mad because now they started getting the crowd. They didn't like the competition, so they uh, then began to persecute Paul again and Silas again, which caused him now to leave Thessalonica, but he left Silas and Timothy there to continue to teach the young Christians there. And so he moves on, he goes to Athens, and some of the he went to Athens and dealt with them. He said something that was significant. I want you guys to see this. Watch this. Let me see if y'all can. Go to the book of Acts. I want y'all to see this. That's Acts uh, chapter 17. Yeah. Go to Acts chapter 17, verse 23. Everybody there? Acts chapter 17, verse 23. I want to show you something. Okay, so he's in Athens. He's reasoning now with these Greek philosophers. You had the Epicureans, who were those philosophers who believed in living by pleasure. Uh, so they said, don't let nothing hold you back. Just do it. Just whatever you feel. Just do it. Just like Nike. Just do it. But then you had the Stoic philosophers that didn't believe it, that you have to have some kind of discipline, and that you have to discipline your flesh, and therefore you have to deny yourself if you really want to seek wisdom. Amen. So here Paul is between two, uh, if you're a polemic or extreme point of view from these philosophers. And then in verse 23, look what he says. He says, For I passed by and beheld your devotions, 
I found an altar with this inscription, the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Do you understand? And I, it just hit me when we was listening to this thing that some people worship God in ignorance. Watch it. Now watch it. Most people say, oh, what are you saying? That's like a story. No, no, no. I'm not trying to be the derogatory, right? Because ignorant comes from the infinitive to ignore. Some people worship God in ignorance because they choose to ignore when God's trying to speak, when God's trying to show himself strong, and so then they're asking, why do you understand what this is happening to me? And they, they're blowing your phone up, and you're like, man, I really have something to do, and you listen to a barrage of, of you don't know why, people feel sorry for themselves, and, and you're trying to say, where's your faith? And then, then you can start talking to people, and then you, they tell themselves, do you, do you, you didn't notice that that was God right there trying to get your attention? Now they go to church, don't get them wrong. They go to church, you know, some, sometimes they show up to Bible church, sometimes they show up to choir, they get them sometimes in Christian. But they worship God in ignorance. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, so Paul is now, uh, makes his way after he, he, he leaves there frustrated. Some people got converted and some didn't. Now he ends up in the city of Corinth where he stays for a year and a half. But he is concerned about these young Christians because he didn't get to spend very much time with them. So he writes a letter, sends it back to Timothy, sends Tim, Timothy back as an envoy to check on how they're doing. All right. What we talked about, like in chapter one, we know that they were going through persecutions. Amen. They were going through persecutions. But in so in chapter one, verse five, we just want to walk to until we get back to chapter five. He says, "For our gospel came not unto you." in word only, but also in power, in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye you know what manner men we were among you. Watch this. He said, you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction. And this is the one thing I think is fascinating, because Christians think, oh, I'm saved, I'm sanctified, I'm Holy Ghost, I go to church every Sunday, I sow my tithe. They think they're not supposed to have any trouble. But when you are being taught the principles of the kingdom of God, you have to know there's going to be some trials that's going to come by. I can prove it back it up in the gospel. Jesus uh, and Matthew, he was teaching them about the kingdom of heaven. He said the kingdom of heaven is like a pearl that a man found in the field. Went back and sold everything he had and he bought the field. He didn't buy the field because he wanted the field. He bought the field because he wanted the pearl. He said that is what the kingdom of heaven is like. So he was using parables, teaching them about the kingdom of heaven. And the minute he finished his teaching, he said, let's get into the boat and go to the other side. So instead of the disciples taking him at his word, he said, we're going to get to the other side. They get into the boat after this great teaching, after he just sold them, and then a storm came. After he didn't talk to the word, after he didn't play them, and then they got scared because he was at the front of the boat sleep on a pillow. Now you gotta ask yourself, Jesus had to be tired, he's on the boat, it's raining, water's coming over into the boat, so he was getting wet, but he was sleeping. And so they wake him up out of his slumber and said, Lord, do you not care that we are perishing in these little deep? Oh ye of little faith. Watch this. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If he says, oh, you of little faith, that means you got a little word in you. <laughs> That's why you come to Bible class. You come because it's important that you get the word in you to help you to stand against the storms that life throws at you. Amen? And so these young Christians are going through, but Paul, he is impressed because even though they were young converts, now you don't understand, these people came out of a very, oh my God, debauchery of the, I mean, I mean, these are Greeks who uh, would just do their business out loud in the street. They didn't care, walk around. They, they were doing all kinds, bowing down the statues. I mean, getting drunk, having parties. They didn't care, and that when he sold the word of God in their lives, these people turn from serving Durham idols to serving the living God. And what he was concerned about, he said, I don't want y'all to backslide, so I'm writing this letter just to check up on you, Timothy is giving me a report, and I am well pleased. And so he's continuing to instruct them in what it means to live for Christ. Under the umbrella of expecting the return of Jesus Christ. I'm going to get to this in a minute. God is hanging over. So the inspection of this, so he's telling them how to live. He's praising God for how they have responded to the persecution, to the, uh, to the afflictions, and how they hung in there. Amen? Amen. Now watch this. Let me go over. Chapter 1, verse 15. If you haven't marked this in your Bible, it said mark these scriptures because, see, uh, my wife was asking me, and she said, I think when you first start reading the Bible, like,